Welcome to the New Commons. I'm John Michael Dumay. And I'm Johanna Laurie. And we have a special guest today with us, Representative Jim Kofel. And we're here to talk about uh, the election outlook and kind of what, what's coming up for the legislative session in New Hampshire in uh, 2025, 2026, the two-year uh, the two-year session, uh, Representative Kofalt is a sec second-term state representative uh, serving the towns of Wilton, Temple, and New Ipswich. He's the Deputy Majority Leader in the New Hampshire House and serves on the Health and Human Services and El Elderly Affairs Committee and also on the Fish and Game and Marine Resources Committee. Busy man. Um, he's also a founding member of the 603 Alliance here in New Hampshire, an organization that's committed to restoring constitutional principles uh, at all levels of government. He's also served as an elected school board and budget committee member. Jim is a strong proponent of medical freedom, uh, the Second Amendment, free speech, property rights, and free market economics. Jim has sponsored successful legislation to preserve civil liberties during a declared state of emergency. Uh, hopefully those states are over, but we'll talk about that, and to protect children living in foster homes from uh, disparate vaccine mandates from other children living in the home. As a representative, uh, Jim has expressed his commitment to support personal freedoms, low taxes, and responsible uh, transparent government. Uh, Jim was uh, here at one of our inaugural episodes last year, um, and we like to talk about um, how to work across the aisle because that's part of the mission of the show. So go ahead and take it away, Yeah. Johanna. Well, I, I was remembering when you were here last, and you were talking about in, and that was 2022, wasn't it, I believe? I think so. Yes, when we were still in the pandemic, and we had lots to talk about with that. And so I'm kind of wondering, in last year, for instance, and this year, um, in terms of cross-party cooperation, mm -hmm. how has it been? Has it been better since the pandemic supposedly is over? <laughs> is it not? Are the, what particular things stand out mm -hmm. for you as being um, important things that you got to, that you have passed together? So, um, but, Good question. So I think the, the answer on, you know, is there cross-party collaboration depends a lot on the issue. Um, I think that there are some um, environmental issues, for example, where we've had really good cross-party collaboration. Um, you know, people are concerned about PFAS contamination in the water. They're concerned about other environmental issues. We had some bills relating to landfills in New Hampshire. Um, there, there is a group of legislators again, both sides of the aisle who are concerned about um, the possibility of New Hampshire's National Guard being deployed without there being a, an act of Congress declaring war. Um, those are some things that I think matter to, to both sides of the aisle. I think there have been some free speech issues as well where we've had that kind of collaboration. Um, I know personally I've been working with a Democrat on the uh, Health and Human Services and Elderly Affairs Committee, who brought forward a bill uh, about something called biosimilars. Um, I'll say it's, it's a sort of, I'll call it a classification of pharmaceuticals. I'm probably technically incorrect there. But the idea is, um, you know, that if we allowed, uh, if we allowed physicians and patients the freedom to substitute similar, uh, what are called biosimilars, that would bring prices way down. That would get them the same results that they're getting today with the far more expensive version, um, and so that you know that's a that's a sort of a patient's rights, medical freedom, um, cost of living issue that, as Democrats and Republicans, we're working together on. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of that there's a lot of opportunity for that kind of thing. Sometimes it uh, it gets drowned out by the noise of you know we're all sort of at each other's at each other's throats and there are a, there are a number of us though who are really we're we're trying to bring some more civility to the conversation and I think as a body the house does a pretty good job of that but you know sometimes outside the house chambers people get emotional people post things on Twitter and um, you know I. I I, I think there, there's a desire to do better, and um, you know, a lot of us are trying to further that conversation. Well, did you see actual examples um, this year where people stepped out of their party um, line and 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 and, and really? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I'll I'll give an example um, around medical freedom. Uh, Representative Jonah Wheeler, 
from Peterborough, is a Democrat. He's a founding member of the Progressive Caucus. Um, he is one of the most principled and politically courageous people I know. Young guy, lots of energy, really charismatic speaker. And he spoke on a bill related to vaccines. This was going back two years now, I think. Um, and it was a it was a bill that would have, and I, I, to be honest, I don't remember the exact nature of the bill, but it, it was essentially for greater transparency and freedom for people to decide whether they want to be vaccinated or not. He spoke in favor of that bill, which was not a popular position with many members of his party and certainly, certainly with his party leadership. This past year, uh, he did something that I think caused a lot more turmoil uh, among his, his colleagues. We had a bill, House Bill 619, which uh, prohibits certain kinds of transgender surgery on minors, um, what's called bottom surgery on minors in the state of New Hampshire. And um, keep in mind that in New Hampshire, it's illegal for somebody under 18 to go to a tanning salon. Even with parental permission, they can't use a tanning salon. Um, Jonah got up and gave a speech and he said, look, I, I, I consider myself to be an avid proponent of equal rights for everyone. I stand with the LGBT community. I, you know, I, I don't see my position on this bill as going against that in any way, but I feel like I have to draw the line somewhere. And the repercussions for him were pretty serious. Um, security was posted in the ante room for the rest of the day. There was there was a sort of a a, a real concern that um, his safety was going to be in jeopardy. And um, not from other reps, but from from a rep of, yes. from, from other reps. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, and so, um, in any case, that I see him as a very politically courageous person. I think a lot of people from the, he, he's earned the respect of a lot of people in the legislature. Um, they did try to primary him. He won his primary. He is one of the Democrat candidates for Peterborough. And I am looking forward to serving with him for another two years in the legislature. Wow. Great, great guy. But tell us a little bit more, because this, this to me is, is, is very, um, uh, scary that you, that you actually worried about a person's physical safety. There, when they stand, when they step out of line, um, say something. There, emotions can sometimes get very heated, and there was a heated exchange in which um, somebody was seemed to be sort of losing control, and somebody, another Democrat rep, stepped in between the two of them and said, "Stop." Mm -hmm. Certainly, Jonah was not furthering that mm -hmm. escalation. Mm -hmm. um, he's not that kind of a person at all. But it, you know, it. It's that kind of thing, which um, it, it's it, it's happening all around America and all around the world right now, yeah, and it's it's a high, it's a very um, concerning kind of mm -hmm. dynamic that we're living in. So yeah, speaking of free speech, I've, mm -hmm. I've got a, a, a lot that we can talk about, and uh, Johanna and I have talked about free speech for the last mm -hmm. couple of episodes, censorship, industrial complex in particular, mm -hmm. but let's stick right now with the legislature, if you will. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there um, any discussion uh, to talk about free speech in the legislature as or, or mechanisms by which you know, people's speech can be protected or understood in, in a different way so that these kinds of, uh, you know, kerfuffles that you had, I don't know if mm -hmm. kerfuffle is the right word, uh, you know, don't happen again. It's like, because this is, this is, it seems like a, an assault front um, by, by certain groups uh, and elites on, you know, what we're able to talk about. And we need to have like an agreement among adults mm -hmm. that, you know, we're going to come together in good faith and not, you know, sling mud at each other for having different perspectives. What is the, the overall sense in the legislature nowadays for uh, preserving uh, or maybe expanding that understanding. Again, I think that the, you know, generally speaking, people want to get along. It is very often those most passionate, loudest voices that dominate the spotlight. Um, so 
we were talking before the show about, um, you know, there, there needs to be a space in which people with differing opinions can come together and have a conversation and risk maybe upsetting the other side, but have an honest conversation and be willing to find points of disagreement in order to discover those common ground areas where people do get along. And what I didn't say because we <laughs> we ran out of time in that conversation was that the, that kind of neutral space is, I think, very valuable, but sometimes you've got people on both sides standing right outside the safe space screaming so loudly because they don't want that conversation to happen. Mm -hmm. they, you, they want you to be here or they want you to be here. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's unfortunate. I think what we really need is more people standing up saying, no, we are going to have this conversation. We're not going to talk about um, narratives that everything is all this way or all that way. Um, and I'll give you a great example of this. Um, I went down to the southern border I think it was a year, a year and a half ago, um, to meet with Border Patrol. Southern border of the United States. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, so we were in Yuma, Arizona. We met with Border Patrol. We met with some uh, social service um, charities that are doing a lot to help immigrants down there. Um, we met with business people, farmers, and my big takeaway is that this is a far more nuanced issue than than either side wants to let on. So I do believe that we have a problem with the border and with security and that we need to secure the border. But I also think that um, <laughs> we are painting this in stark black and white terms and we ought not to allow ourselves to be dragged into either of those positions. So when you look at some of the news stories about crime that's happening around the country, that's absolutely real. It's a problem and we need to deal with the problem. Um, but one of the things that, um, <laughs> one of the things that, that the former border security chief, uh, border patrol chief uh, down in Arizona said is we really need to be a country of wide gates and high fences. In other words, there are great opportunities to work together with our neighbor, to work realistically, reasonably, compassionately, but avoid some of the problems that we're seeing. But if you if you watch CNN, you're gonna see that, um, you know, it's all, you know, young families with kids and they're looking for a better way of life. Some truth to that. If you watch Fox News, it's a bunch of sort of angry, you know, people with bad intentions. Um, sometimes truth to that too. The real issue is so much more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. And so I am opposed to sanctuary cities in New Hampshire. I voted, you know, to, for the bill that would have prohibited them. Um, I, I I think I agree with. I, I would I would say I'm I'm very much in the in the camp that believes that we need strong border security. At the same time, um, I think we need to be willing to look beyond the sort of uniform perspective of that position or that position. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nuance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need time, space, and permission, mm -hmm. you know, in a what I sometimes think of as a cauldron or, or an environment in which people can have those disagreements mm -hmm. freely and not feel like they have to necessarily rush to a conclusion or, or to but if we get back protect to the, the, the issue of free speech yes I, i'm coming back yeah, yes for sure yeah so um i know that you were involved in a campus free speech bill i wanted to before we uh, talk exactly about what you did i just noticed today in my email inbox um a an article by greg lukanoff who has the attorney eternally radical idea substack he is the co-author with Jonathan Haidt of uh, The Coddling mm -hmm. of the American Mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, The Coddling of the American Mind movie just came out on Amazon and other streaming services. But he notes that in the uh, universities in the United States, there's a, a continuing culture of cancellation. He just mm -hmm. came out with a book called The Canceling of the American Mind with a, a Gen Z journalist, Ricky Schlott. Um, and uh, they, uh, in this book, they basically talk about um, the ramping up in cancellations 
uh, especially of, of uh, professors who get punished. I guess in the past decade, there was like over a thousand campaigns to get professors punished for their First Amendment protected speech. Uh, nearly two thirds of those campaigns have succeeded. Mm -hmm. um, I know uh, Jonathan Haidt and and others have started the Heterodox Academy to, to try to push back against that. Um, and of course, there's also uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, essentially conformity statements that are required mm -hmm. for a lot of these places, um, which seems to go in the opposite direction of free speech. So can you right. talk about your the campus bill that you that you passed and um, you know what the prospects are for New Hampshire in addressing free speech issues? Right. So that that bill, the prime sponsor for that bill was Daniel Popovici Miller, who is from Windham. And I know he worked extremely hard on that. So I can't take very much credit for it at all. I put my name as a co-sponsor because I believe it's an important issue. Um, he was working with a national organization that is committed to, uh, to free speech. I don't recall the name of the organization fire. at the moment. I, yes, yeah. it's FIRE. Um, and so they were working closely with him. Um, but he was really working hard to build consensus and um, really point out the issue that free speech is fundamental. We ought not to have um, sort of what are called free speech zones, which it's sort of the, the, the implication being everything outside of the zone is not a free speech area, um, that we, we really need to, uh, to normalize free speech on college campuses. And so um, that was the essence of the bill. I think it, it got a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion. Um, Daniel did a, a, a phenomenal job. Um, working on the House side to get it through the House and then really shepherding it through the Senate as well. So I think it's a step forward. We have some, you know, we've seen some other bills, um, some of them related to these ESG initiatives. And ESG is a double-edged sword because sometimes when people say ESG, they're talking about um, accountability standards for protecting the environment. Some of those may be good, sound ideas, some of them not. Um, Explain what ESG stands for. I'm sorry. ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And um, the idea is that um, corporations will um, sort of come together to agree that everyone in our supply chain must comply with these things. Um, and they get scored. On and they get scored on it. And so, so, the, so, right. so the idea is if, if you don't play along you don't do business, period, you're done. That's sort of a scary proposition because it bypasses anyone who is a representative of the people and it simply says, you've got an oligarchy of large corporations saying, we're gonna set a bunch of rules and you will all follow them or else. That's a, a huge concern and it's why another of my colleagues, J.D. Bernardi, has brought ESG-related bills forward several times. Um, one of those uh, one of those bills was um, criticized because they say, "Oh well, you're saying that people are going to lose their their Second Amendment rights because they posted, uh, you know, a, a political meme on Facebook or something like this." And that's ridiculous. That's not happening. the The reality is that the the greater concern is that uh, somebody comes along and says, "Well, you know, one of your executives said something that we don't like about." a political situation somewhere in the world or whatever it may be. They said something we don't like. That's a, that's going to be a negative on your corporation's ESG score and that that has implications. So we have seen people who've been debanked because they were selling t-shirts that somebody didn't like or, uh, or whatnot. Those are concerns. I think that the the zeal to squash free speech, um, how can I put this? I, I think the, the suppression of free speech is, is far more dangerous and evil than any of the speech that they might be suppressing. Yeah. Um, it was, there was a, uh, I guess I, I call it a, a conspiracy really. It's, it's, uh, I'm not sure if you could call, even call it racketeering exactly, um, but it was uh, the, uh, organization of advertisers called GARM. Mm. Uh, I can't remember what it stood for now, uh, G-A-R-M, but that essentially conspired to um, prevent 
advertisers from advertising on like X, which mm -hmm. is formerly Twitter. Right. And they basically said, you know, if you, you know, we're, we're going to come together and we're going to decide mm -hmm. because we don't like their politics or this person's politics or whatever, that mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's it. And so that's a particularly, I think, uh, underhanded way, although it's understandable mm -hmm. that they would do that, but it's, it's a, kind of another, now they stopped doing that since because I think mm -hmm. they recognize that that maybe might fall afoul of certain kind of, uh, you know, monopolistic uh, mm -hmm. uh, policies or laws. I'm not sure exactly, but uh, obviously when people got wind of it, it wasn't mm -hmm. looked upon as exactly in line with the, with the noble ideals of free speech. And right. so I'm wondering if, you know, just before we move on to another topic, you, you know, if you can just comment more generally on what you're seeing in the censorship zone and on this tendency to label everything mm -hmm. as misinformation and, and disinformation. And to normalize it. This is, I think, right. normalization yeah. of censorship. Is, right. I think it's a problem because yeah. if you're over and over yeah. um, sort of acclimatizing people to the notion that free speech is not completely allowed, it's only allowed mm -hmm. in certain places, but not here and not well, there. Right. And, exactly. and actually what you're doing is you're saying, what is normal is censorship. Mm. Of the opposite, yeah. and you have right. people like Hillary Clinton yeah. and John yeah. Kerry and lots of other people, you know, calling for outright censorship. Yeah. Right. Well, one one thing that that really stood out for me was when a uh, member of the White House press corps asked the question in a press conference, like, "Shouldn't we be doing something about all this bad speech or hate speech?" I can't. Really, uh, I, I don't want to let this topic end without mentioning what's going on in Brazil. And I don't know if uh, a lot of people are not following what's happening in Brazil, but Alexander Moraes, the uh, head of the Supreme Court in Brazil, has declared that X, Twitter, is now outlawed. Um, you cannot use Twitter if you use a VPN to access X to access Twitter outside of Brazil, the fine is 50,000 reals per day, which is about $8,000 per day for doing that. Um, the, so um, much for the anonymity of VPNs? Right. Well, in, in, well, I think a lot of Americans were using their VPNs to connect to servers in Brazil just to create problems for the Brazilian government in this uh -huh. case. Um, I might have done that. Um, the... the um, <laughs> the, but but what's really amazing is that on Brazilian Independence Day, um, the streets, the, the main thoroughfare in Sao Paulo, the Avenida Paulista, was, I, I've never seen so many people in my life. It was, there was drone footage going down the Avenida Paulista. And I have to say, there must have been millions of people out protesting the, the suppression of free speech and just the, the overreach of this Supreme Court. Um, the battle is continuing and there, there have been impeachment measures um, brought against Alexander Morais. I hope that they continue to press forward. I hope to succeed. Uh, but people need to understand what we have here in the United States, that we have a history and a culture of freedom of expression and if that is taken away, if we allow that to be eroded by the normalization of censorship, we're going into a very dark place. And I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, and there's all kinds of straw men that they are introducing into the equation, such as mm -hmm. misinformation, right. disinformation, which is, I think RFK said, if you hear misinformation, you know that, that you've just been subjected to a PSYOP, mm. uh, which is to say yep. that, you know, it's information that doesn't agree with somebody right. in a position of power. Right. And they have not only they, have, you know, they have the power to essentially force um, public organizations or private organizations like social media companies to do the government's bidding or to do the bidding of a pharmaceutical mm. corporation or some other corporation that doesn't like what you have to say. And mm. a lot of times it's actually true, right? The, the misinformation can be actually true, but it goes against some kind of, you know, some kind of official narrative or policy. Mm. This is, this is the dangerous part. I don't think Democrats when I'm me being formally one, I, I fully understand the the kind of the nature of the emergent attack on free speech mm -hmm. and how it's coming from all quarters, and also how things like AI uh, can be deployed in in this suppression. 
Mm -hmm. I think because the Democrats, and I also am a form of one, um, feel that as long as they have free speech, everything's okay. You know? Well, that's, what, that's the impression I get. <laughs> well, exactly. It, it's it's a, it's a little it's and this is you know part of a larger issue. I'm sorry for throwing a lot at you here, but it's a larger issue of you know politics in general of you know winner take all. You know, if I right. if I win, right. I get to tell everybody you know what to do, and it mm. seems to me we kind of have to get over that. And yep. I think that's part of what you've been talking about. It it is, and so that's a good segue to <laughs> what happened on Veto Day. So. We had veto day a couple of weeks ago, which is when the legislature comes together and we vote on bills that have been vetoed by the governor. Are we going to override the veto or not? And I had a bill that was vetoed, House Bill 396, um, which relates to biological sex. It means it or it, it basically stipulates that it is permissible to um, distinguish who uses the men's room or the ladies room, locker rooms prisons and sports based on biological sex. It doesn't say you have to. It simply says you you may, and it's not going to be classified as discrimination. And I understand some people don't agree with that position. Um, it's but, hardly a radical but, idea. But I, but I was, you know, I knew going into veto day, there was no way that was going to get overturned. Mm -hmm. I did use the opportunity to give a short speech about the the fact that there are there are two very very different positions and that if we allow ourselves to fall into um, one absolute position that completely invalidates the the opposing view or the other that completely invalidates that opposing point of view we are never going to find win-win solutions to problems i actually felt like this bill was the the bill that was most likely to produce a positive outcome can we all live together? This was my attempt to do that. So, so I, I gave a short, a short talk and basically said, in the in the initial hearing for this bill, we heard from a transgender person who, you know, I'll keep it short and paraphrase, basically said, "Don't hate us." Mm -hmm. And all I could think was, "I don't hate you. I've never hated you. I don't even know you." Um, but we also heard from a young mom who was a survivor of sexual assault who described how it affects her to this day. And she said, all I wanted to do was to protect my 12-year-old daughter. And her 12-year-old daughter at the time was being harassed by a 17-year-old boy who was bringing his friends into the girls' locker room and making fun of the girls as they were changing. And I don't think that's right either. How do we, how do we live together in this kind of new normal where everybody gets the respect they deserve as human beings, but not be at each other's throats. And what we've what we've fallen into is you get that narrative or you get that narrative. And I'm saying, I don't want either of those narratives. I want to find a place where we can figure out where it's not a zero-sum win-lose, mm -hmm. but can we work together? And I understand this is a very emotional issue for a lot of people, so they it's it's hard for them to, <laughs> to move off of the one position or the other, but we need to do that. And if we don't do that, we will end up in win-lose situations. There will always be a winner and a loser, and th that may flip back and forth with every election. We need to figure out how to live together. That's my position. Tough one. <laughs> yeah, tough one. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to bring up the subject of money. <laughs> mm. which is a perennial problem here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, it, it, occurred, it has occurred to me as I'm a reader of the Sentinel when I see what bills are coming up and what, what what's happening, that recently, because of the pandemic funds drying up, mm -hmm. that New Hampshire was doing pretty well with those in terms mm -hmm. of using those for, for good causes. But now mm -hmm. with that money disappearing, there's a question of how are we going to replace that here? Mm -hmm. Is that been addressed this year? Is it going to be addressed next year? I'm thinking more in terms of also, you know, the um, they talked about they, they wanted to reduce some of the business taxes, but then now you're seeing that if you reduce these business taxes, maybe it's going to actually increase taxes for mm -hmm. ordinary people. So how are we work? What are we doing about money? <laughs> money is it 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 is very much on people's minds right now. As I'm out talking to voters. People are scared. Um, right now, the legis well, 
first I'll talk about some of the some of the the federal money that has flowed into the state over the past few years, you know, was to be designated for one-time expenditures. And naturally there are people in state agencies who sort of want to say, okay, well, we'll want to hire for a position. But the time when the next budget comes around, they're, they're, they're probably going to say, well, you know, it was so useful. We want to continue that expenditure. So I'm going to say, theoretically, we should not be particularly um, focused on the idea that we need to replace those. Because when I hear replace those, I think raise taxes on mm -hmm. people and I don't want to do that. Um, if we can replace them with some federal money, um, that's reasonable. But I, I also think our, our federal spending is out of control. So I, I'm not sure I love that that approach either. The, um, the reality is that we are going to, as a state, we're going to need to further tighten our belt. We've done a very good job with the last two budgets, holding the line on spending, actually decreasing spending um, in, in a lot of areas. Um, but we're, we're looking at having to tighten our belts as a state. And so I think there's there's a lot of discussion happening right now about how do we aggressively do that. We have also, uh, we have dialed back or we've, we've accelerated the phase out of the interest and dividends tax. So this mm -hmm. is something that's come, a lot of, uh, come up a lot in the gubernatorial race. The interest and dividends tax was sort of the only remaining income tax in New Hampshire. Um, well, if you're a business owner, I apologize. There's there's an income tax on business owners, but but for most people, that was the New Hampshire income tax. We three or four years ago, we we uh, said we're going to phase that out over. I think it was five years. With the budget we passed a year and a half ago, we said we're going to accelerate it. As of the end of this year, we will no longer have an interest in dividends tax. That adversely affects older people on a fixed income. If they're living off of, 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 of bonds or or stock dividends, that advers adversely affects them. That will be gone. Um, one of our gubernatorial candidates, has Joyce Craig, has said she wants to bring it back. The Democrats tried five times to bring it back. Um, I just don't think that's a good idea. We've also, we've, we've tried to shift money back to the city, the the cities and towns. We've we we've introduced provisions that would take some of the meals and, and uh, rooms taxes back to the cities and towns. What we see is that when we do that, typically, people in the cities and towns, instead of giving it back to taxpayers, lowering the tax rate, they see it as an opportunity to spend on those things that they really didn't want to mm -hmm. cut from their budgets. But um, you know now they can they can spend it. So. One of the things we're looking at going forward is, um, you know, that maybe we should be rebating that money directly to taxpayers, so everybody gets a check. Um, if you if you paid into those taxes, get some of that money back. Um, it, you know, we'll we'll see if that's a popular enough idea to to move it forward. But people are concerned about their property taxes. They don't necessarily understand what's going on at the at the school district level and the town level. Um, there's a lot of detail to that. A lot of it, quite honestly, is very, very difficult for school boards to even control. I've been there. Um, but the economy is the number one issue, I think. The economy and housing. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are two top of mind issues for people. Mm -hmm. So, Tina, yeah, talk a little bit about housing yeah. in New Hampshire in particular. Yeah. Um, so, housing is, I mean, I, I think... It, it's it's a complicated issue, and there there are issues that even a lot around sort of how do we balance zoning with property rights. That it's very hard to find exactly the right line because I don't. I think a lot of people they buy a house in a community with the idea that you know my my neighbor's not going to build a high rise next to me. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, zoning is is useful and valuable and important. Um, but there's also something called an ADU or an accessory dwelling unit. And by right in New Hampshire, you can build an accessory dwelling unit, but some cities and towns will impose unreasonable restrictions. You wanna build that one extra accessory dwelling unit, well, you'll need to have 20 parking spaces. I'm exaggerating a bit, but <laughs> it's those kinds of barriers that they're putting up because they really don't want that. So we had some bills that were in, 
intended to prevent cities and towns from putting up those barriers, but they also increased the, the number of ADUs you could build on your property by right from one to three, and I think that rubbed some people the wrong way. We, it would have probably been better had we had a middle ground bill there. ADUs are a phenomenal way of, um, if, if, if an older person wants to stay in their home, but they need rental income, or they want to move into an ADU and rent out their house, they can stay in their home. They don't have to leave. If you have adult children who are working on buying their first home, but they need a couple of years and you want them to stay here in New Hampshire, build an ADU. You can, you can have them live there. So those, those situations, I think, are uh, something that we need to explore further. And then there, there are some other areas. But that area. doesn't help much with the overall housing problem because that's the, in, there are some the highest people who need yeah, to I live mean, somewhere. So, yeah. so I mean, I, I think the other problem is that we put a lot of barriers in the way of building homes. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give one example that came up. It was a very prominent example that came up in the legislature this past two years, which is that we, we as a state decided to adopt an updated version of the National Building Code. Um, we ended up adopting part of it. The part that we did not adopt are what I would call these sort of Green New Deal kind of um, much more stringent requirements for what you need to do to make your home energy efficient. That is beneficial. I, I believe in energy efficiency. In my own home, I have invested in it a lot in energy efficiency. I strongly believe in it but that was my choice. If we had adopted those measures as part of our building code, it would add $20,000 to the cost of a new home, mm -hmm. up to eighty dollars or $90,000 to the cost of a new mm -hmm. home, sort of depending on the, the size and, and nature of the home. So, you know, we, we just, we need to understand the cost when we put regulations in that, like that in, in place, we have to do the sort of the look at the costs and the benefits. I think all too often people are only looking at the benefits and they ignore the costs. That's not realistic. That's not real life. So I think if we take some of the red tape out, we can improve that situation. And with regard, I guess, and education is another thorny issue that mm -hmm. falls under the uh, rubric of money problems too, because yes. is who's going to fund uh, education and we've had such battles this year and I assume that the legislature is because they're still they're fighting these lawsuits right mm -hmm. that come your way and what what what's your prognosis or what's going to happen to that um, right. hard to know what's going to happen in terms of what the what the courts will do um, I will say that I think that there is an appetite for addressing the problem if we look at spending the the spending per pupil since the Claremont decision um, has has increased, and, and I, don't, I don't have the numbers mm. on, and at the top of my head, but it's increased substantially. Mm. Academic performance has not increased at all. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. We have um, we have school districts that are paying six figure salaries to you know a chief DEI officer, mm -hmm. which is their right to do, and yet there are legitimate complaints about how much we're paying our teachers. So I had a colleague who introduced something called the Students First Act, which would have said, if you're going to hire that DEI hire and pay them six figures, then you you need to first increase your teacher salaries. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's there, there are initiatives like that. Um, it, it's just the 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 problem of education funding, I think, comes largely from the fact that we have, you know, we have a lot of, of school districts that people like their local school, but even as enrollment has dropped, your fixed costs stay the same, your variable costs, there's sort of a fuzzy area which are called step costs, they're not really fixed or variable. Can you have one less, less classroom if you have one less student? No. Maybe you need 25 less students or 20 less students to have one less classroom. How do you scale down when your population of, yeah. of school-age students decreases? And that is a problem that has 
space the entire region for course, quite some time. And locally here, it's just because there is the recommendation to close several mm -hmm. of the uh, elementary schools and the, lo the localities don't want that. They right. want their right. <laughs> school. But it's expensive. But yeah, they're, yeah, they're right. dealing with the whole money question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Property taxes have tripled since Red I was Trump. in my house a yeah. few years ago. That's yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, so, you can't. You just can't keep going up every year. Right. Yeah. You expect people to be able to. But is there is there another way? Because you know, almost every other state has a state income tax. Mm -hmm. as other ways to pay for education, and right. we don't. You know, we we only have our property tax yeah, here. We haven't. We have so pushed for any kind of broad based tax. Is no, that is that no. ever under consideration? Um, mm -hmm. I I hope it's not. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I I understand the spirit in which you say that, I'm going to say I. My concern is that when your tax dollars, the further your tax dollars go from home, mm -hmm. the more likely that, that they will be used inefficiently. Mm -hmm. And that is my concern is that um, you, you, not only are you, you're gonna send money to Concord and then it's gonna flow back to your mm -hmm. local school district. It, <laughs> there, there's going to be a lot of decisions that lead to spending in in between the yeah, in between yeah. concord and and coming back to your school district mm -hmm. and it comes with strings attached yeah um you know governments and the federal government is is you know masterful at this we're going to give you all kinds of we're going to take your yeah. money we're going to take your money uh and then we're going to give it back to you with strings attached and you know we, we in the process we are losing control over a great many things um you know medicare medicaid is you know is is vitally important economically for our state, for every state, for individuals here, and, and making sure that they're, they get health care. And yet, it is what prevented us from protecting health care workers from mandated vaccines, yeah. from mandating yeah. the COVID yeah. vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it, to me, that is, there, there comes a point where you, you, mm -hmm. you really have to ask the question, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think anybody has the appetite to turn down large amounts of federal money. That's the problem. Yeah. They know that, mm -hmm. so the the strings remain to, remain attached. And I, I think that's a that's a problem with our federal state relations, you know, well, throughout the country. Let's, let's just briefly get into the. Um, oh, we have a little time. Um, how how is money going to affect this, or is already affecting this election in New Hampshire? Because that's the other thing, money being the basic divide really between the the, the two parties in terms of how you want to deal with it. That now in, in in particularly in a election like this one, it comes down to the candidates which are supporting these points of view, mm -hmm. and whether they're being funded by in-state money or out-of-state money. Mm -hmm. And we see locally already that there are some pretty good examples mm -hmm. of, of, of how that funding goes, mm -hmm. and which is likely to influence the election. But how can you say anything about that or how you feel about that? Um, I, I generally feel like the, the it's a, for me, it, I frame it as a free speech issue that if you, if you want to contribute money to getting the message out, that is your right to do. Um, we have a pretty rigorous campaign finance reporting requirement in our state. All of us do it. It's not difficult, it's not onerous. Um, so I think it, you know, we can be clear about that. There are groups that we, that, that are spending money independently that are mm -hmm. from out of state that we actually don't even have control over. I mean, I've had people knock doors in my district and hand out literature and I have no control over what they're saying or mm -hmm. when they do it or where they go. Um, now you're talking about um, representatives and, and to state government, but then we'll be talking mm -hmm. about who we're going to be electing to federal, federal government, government and, yeah. and to- um, And those people yeah. spending what? Right. Eight, nine hours a day of mm -hmm. uh, fundraising? Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when do they do the I, people's work? You know? I think, yeah. so, yeah. so, Again, I still see it as a, a free speech issue. If you know Hollywood elites want to spend their money on New Hampshire campaigns, I do believe it's their right. Um, I also believe it's our right to point it out and say, you know, the, mm -hmm. yeah. do you really want to elect the favorite of you know, it could be Hollywood elites or pick any outside group that mm -hmm. you know you don't necessarily but agree you, with? But do you hear that? You see, does your point of view get across when they're spending all their money on yeah. on ads on TV yeah. and they're right. 
you know, yeah, it's, they drown you it's, out. It's a funny speech. I think yeah. it's United was a terrible, yeah. it's a terrible decision. And I don't think money is speech. <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't, you know, corporations are not persons. They mm. can't feel a pain. They they have no compunction. Uh, you know, we, we know that liability in corporations protects almost mm. all of the key players. And just look at Big Pharma. Look at, look at where they were able to pass in, in the 80s. Mm. You know, the National Vaccine Childhood Injury uh, mm. Act. You know, it's like, and they're, they're shielded now. What was the PrEP Act in, in the last four years? Told, a total shield. For, for malfeasance and right. all manner of things that we are now discovering, mm -hmm. uh, which are still not really getting the light of day because of free speech right. in, in, uh, suppression. Right. And and so my, hang on, I believe very, very strongly that the answer to our problems lies in an educated electorate. That is That can be a tall order. People are busy. They're you know, they're raising families, they're going to their job, they're, they're, people have a lot on their plate as it is. So asking them to read all the bills that come through Congress and the State House is not reasonable. And yet there are a lot of organizations around the state and around the country that put out newsletters and say, you need to be aware of this bill that's coming through, it's, it's a threat. It is really unfortunate, like, so you talked about the PREP Act, you know, I know of a case of, you know, and this has made a lot of news, a, a, a young boy in Brattleboro, Vermont, who was given the COVID vaccine despite his parents explicitly saying, no, he's not getting it, and never providing a, a permission form. That has gone through uh, several, um, several courts, um, several appeals, and the answer has always been the same. The PREP Act shields everybody from everything. Yeah, Sorry. The Vermont, Supreme, um, the Vermont Supreme Court right. upheld that. Yeah. Right. And and so to me, th th those kinds of things are are awful. And I think we should hold people accountable who voted for that. And um, I don't think that happens unless the you know, people spend enough time to sort of look at what are the bills, what are the consequences, who voted for it, and do we need to put somebody else in now? So. And we're getting getting back around to the free speech issues mm -hmm. or you know, actual real information. There's such a, a onslaught of, mm -hmm. of misinformation from right. official sources and from mm -hmm. mainstream narrative sources that how is a person, you know, who's not as well informed as us going to really know That's it. what's going on. Shouldn't, maybe there should be some, there should just be the, um, in New Hampshire, that, that, that the House and the Senate should should uh, advertise more when these bills are coming up give people you know a chance i don't know to see that we need it nationally too because bills come up and nobody knows and things get passed then people wonder what how did that happen yeah. and so there's there isn't a, a good way to find there, out unless you're, not, yeah. unless you're doing it you know how mm -hmm. so right. and, and jim you put your you put your finger on it it's difficult to engage the public with everything that's going on especially right. yeah you know yeah. when we, we're in a highly inflationary period for right. reasons that we can probably yeah discuss another time but mm -hmm. uh, you know it's like people when they're in survival mode when they're mm -hmm. just trying to you know get through the day and put food on the table it's very hard to say all right now we, it is now you're going to need to spend a couple hours away from your family mm -hmm. uh you know probably reasonably every week you know during a legislative session to think about you know whether you want these bills passed or not mm -hmm. and then you've got to sit down and spend time thinking about who you're going to write to and then you've got to figure out what you're going to say and right. mm -hmm. and you know and we know that um you know, um, legislators get a lot of, a lot of mail, a lot of email, mm -hmm. and uh, if if it's a cookie cutter thing, they're not going to pay as much attention to it than if it's mm -hmm. well thought out. But if it's a long email, they're probably not going to pay attention to it either. <laughs> so how do you break through this this logjam? I mean, it's really really difficult. Um, well, a couple of things. For, first of all, I think there there's there's a shortcut to spending a couple of hours a week on it, and that is that. There are organizations, many of them volunteer organizations throughout New Hampshire that have their eyes on this stuff and publish newsletters. The example that I will give is um, uh, Rebuild New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, Rebuild New Hampshire is focused on health freedom issues. They were sort of born of the, of the COVID restrictions and the vaccine mandates and all of this. They have looked at a lot of the um, medical freedom issues they look at the bills, they they figure out what is 
if it's not likely to pass at all that you know it'll mm-hmm. it'll go by the wayside if it is if it's something that is really in play and really important and people need to know about it they'll put it in their newsletter <laughs> so if you get a newsletter of an email from them once a week mm-hmm. and you look at it and says click here to contact your representative and tell them you can right. send that email it is true that an email from your district from from the district i'm in always matters more to me it counts more than from somebody and that doesn't mean that it doesn't count if they're outside my district some of the more moving personal stories i've heard happen to be from people outside my district but i want to know about it because it represents what's happening to other people right so you can tell your story but if you're if you're clear i'm in your district be brief i'm writing you about this bill hb 12345 please support it um, you can call. I mean, one of the great things about New Hampshire is we have 400 representatives. That's one representative for every 3,300 people, approximately. That means they're your neighbor. You can pick up the phone and you call them. I've had people call me. I answer the phone. They say, oh, I was expecting to get a member of your staff. And, you know, I just chuckle. It's like, I, love that. I don't know. I am the we, staff. We, we, nobody has staff. This is my cell phone. Um, so, you know, we represent we have a structure for being responsive in New mm-hmm. Hampshire and mm-hmm. I've talked to people people will call me in about something I do not agree with them on it I will talk to them about it some reps aren't quite so engaging but you know I I am here to represent everybody in my district mm-hmm. if they disagree with me on some issues I am still their representative so call me we'll, we'll talk about it and um you know, I, I will at the very least explain to you why I have the position that I have. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just have a few minutes left. I was hoping you would cover some of what's happened in the last year or two to curb the government's ability to declare unending states of emergency. Sure. So <laughs> I'll I'll talk about two pieces of legislation. So House Bill 440 was, I was the prime sponsor of that. You mentioned it in the intro. And that was... Essentially, what we had, <laughs> we had we had a superior court opinion, which said the governor, may, a, a governor, may limit or suspend constitutional rights during a state of emergency. House Bill 440 said, no, you can't. Um, so it was sort of intended to fend off any such action by a future governor. So that passed. It was signed by the governor. In the budget, this last... Um, and what what 20, does that prevent him from doing? Well, it would prevent uh, the governor from saying, I'm going to shut down the newspapers because I'm concerned that they're going to report something I don't like, or they'll report misinformation. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be unconstitutional. But if the Superior Court says, well, you know, unconstitutional is okay during state of emergency, mm-hmm. my position is no, it's not. Um, and so that, that, that legislation was to affirmatively assert, no, it's not. Constitutional rights still apply, emergency or not. Right. Um, the other thing was that, that in, last, uh, in the last budget cycle, two, 2023... So that passed it? That, that yes. It still passed yes. And Governor Sununu signed it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, in the 2023 budget, um, we said, instead of having what is in effect a perpetual state of emergency, where you can just keep renewing it over and over and over again... We said, you can do that up to, I want to say it's 120 days or 107 days. There's a, there's a limit on it. After that limit, you have to get the permission of the legislature because the way it was before, you could effectively say, I'm going to keep renewing it forever. And in order to stop me, they need to get a majority of both houses to stop me. So a governor of either party who has control of one or the other chamber could effectively have a perpetual state of emergency. Mm-hmm. We have stopped that. So mm-hmm. it's it's still not perfect, but it's, it's a lot better than forever. So mm-hmm. that's where we are now. Excellent. <laughs> well, we really appreciate you coming down to, to Keene and spending uh, some time with us and letting us know kind of what the outlook is. And we mm-hmm. look forward to a report maybe sometime during the session or shortly after the session and let us know uh, how it goes in bringing the sides together, which is, you know, in our view, mm-hmm. always the most important thing in trying to get people, again, as you were saying, to stop identifying with the extreme of either view to try to get other people to line up yep. you know, behind a given narrative. That's probably the most important thing. Yep. 
Excellent, for sure. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Okay.